J. Habakkuk Jefferson's Statement In the month of December in the year 1873, the British ship De Gracia steered into Gibraltar, having in tow the derelict brigantine Mary Celeste, which had been picked up in latitude 38 degrees 40 minutes, longitude 17 degrees 15 minutes west. There were several circumstances in connection with the condition and appearance of the abandoned vessel, which excited considerable comment at the time, and aroused a curiosity which had never been satisfied. What these circumstances were was summed up in an able article which appeared in the Gibraltar Gazette. The curious can find it in the issue for January 4, 1874, unless my memory deceives me. For the benefit of those, however, who may be unable to refer to the paper in question, I shall subjoin a few extracts which touch upon the leading features of the case. We have ourselves, says the anonymous writer in the Gazette, been over the derelict Mary Celeste, and have closely questioned the officers of the Dei Gratia on every point which might throw light on the affair. They are of the opinion that she has been abandoned several days, or perhaps weeks, before being picked up. The official log which was found in the cabin states that the vessel sailed from Boston to Lisbon, starting upon October 16th. It is, however, more imperfectly kept, and affords little information. There is no reference to rough weather, and, indeed, the state of the vessel's paint and rigging excludes the idea that she was abandoned for any such reason. She is perfectly watertight. No signs of a struggle or of violence are to be detected, and there is absolutely nothing to account for the disappearance of the crew. There are several indications that a lady was present on board, a sewing machine found in the cabin and some articles of female attire. These probably belong to the captain's wife, who is mentioned in the log as having accompanied her husband. As an instance of the mildness of the weather, it may be remarked that a bobbin of silk was found standing upon a sewing machine, though the least roll of the vessel would have precipitated it to the floor. The boats were intact and slung upon the davits, and the cargo, consisting of tallow and American clocks, was untouched. An old-fashioned sword of curious workmanship was discovered among some lumber in the forecastle, and this weapon is said to exhibit a longitudinal striation of the steel, as if it had been recently wiped. It has been placed in the hands of the police and submitted to Dr. Monahan, the analyst, for inspection. The result of his examination has not yet been published. We may remark in conclusion that Captain Dalton, of the Dei Gratia, an able and intelligent seaman, is of opinion that the Mary Celeste may have been abandoned a considerable distance from the spot at which she was picked up, since a powerful current runs up in that latitude from the African coast. He confessed his inability, however, to advance any hypothesis which can reconcile all the facts of the case. In the utter absence of a clue or grain of evidence, it is to be feared that the fate of the crew of the Mary Celeste will be added to those numerous mysteries of the deep which will never be solved until the great day when the sea shall give up its dead. If crime has been committed, as is much to be suspected, there is little hope of bringing the perpetrators to justice. I shall supplement this extract from the Gibraltar Gazette by quoting a telegram from Boston, which went the round of the English papers, and represented the total amount of information which had been collected about the Mary Celeste. She was, it said, a brigantine of 170 tons burden, and belonged to White, Russell, and White, wine importers, of the city. Captain J. W. Tibbs was an old servant of the firm, and was a man of known ability and tried probity. He was accompanied by his wife, aged 31, and their youngest child, five years old. The crew consisted of seven hands, including two colored seamen and a boy. There were three passengers, one of whom was the well-known Brooklyn specialist on consumption, Dr. Habakkuk Jefferson, who was a distinguished advocate for abolition in the early days of the movement, and whose pamphlet entitled, Where is Thy Brother?, exercised a strong influence on public opinion before the war. The other passengers were Mr. J. Harton, a writer in the employ of the firm, and Mr. Septimus Goring, a half-caste gentleman from New Orleans. All investigations have failed to throw any light upon the fate of these fourteen human beings. The loss of Dr. Jepson will be felt both in political and scientific circles. I have here epitomized, for the benefit of the public, all that has been hitherto known concerning the Mary Celeste and her crew, for the past ten years have not in any way helped to elucidate the mystery. I have now taken up my pen with the intention of telling all that I know of the ill-fated voyage. I consider that it is a duty which I owe to society, for symptoms which I am familiar with in others lead me to believe that before many mouths my tongue and hand may be alike incapable of conveying information. Let me remark, as a preface to my narrative, that I am Joseph Habakkuk Jepson, doctor of medicine at the University of Harvard and ex-consulting physician of the Samaritan Hospital of Brooklyn. Many will doubtless wonder why I have not proclaimed myself before, and why I have suffered so many conjectures and surmises to pass unchallenged. Could the ends of justice have been served in any way by my revealing the facts in my possession, I should unhesitantly have done so. It seems to me, however, that there was no possibility of such a result, and when I attempted after the occurrence to state my case to an English official, I was met with such offensive incredulity that I determined never again to expose myself to the chance of such an indignity. 
I can excuse the discourtesy of the Liverpool magistrate, however, when I reflect upon the treatment which I received at the hands of my own relatives, who, though they knew my unimpeachable character, listened to my statement with an indulgent smile, as if humoring the delusion of a monomaniac. This slur upon my veracity led to a quarrel between myself and John Vanberger, the brother of my wife, and confirmed me in my resolution to let the matter sink into oblivion, a determination which I have only altered through my son's solicitations. In order to make the narrative intelligible, I must run lightly over one or two incidents in my former life which throw light upon subsequent events. My father, William K. Jeffson, was a preacher of a sect called Plymouth Brethren, and was one of the most respected citizens of Lowell. Like most of the other Puritans of New England, he was a determined opponent of slavery, and it was from his lips that I received these lessons which tinged every action of my life. While I was studying medicine at Harvard University, I had already made a mark as an advanced abolitionist, and when, after taking my degree, I bought a third share of the practice of Dr. Willis of Brooklyn, I managed, in spite of my professional duties, to devote a considerable time to the cause which I had at heart, my pamphlet, Where is Thy Brother? Swartzburg, Lister and Co., 1849, attracting considerable attention. When the war broke out, I left Brooklyn and accompanied the 113th New York Regiment through the campaign. I was present at the Second Battle of Bull's Run and at the Battle of Gettysburg. Finally, I was severely wounded at Antietam, and would probably have perished on the field had it not been for the kindness of a gentleman named Murray, who had me carried to his house and provided me with every comfort. Thanks to his charity and to the nursing which I received from his black domestics, I was soon able to get about the plantation with the help of a stick. It was during this period of convalescence that an incident occurred which is closely connected with my story. Among the most assiduous of the negresses who had watched my couch during my illness, there was one old crone who appeared to exert considerable authority over the others. She was exceedingly attentive to me, and I gathered from the few words that passed between us that she had heard of me, and that she was grateful to me for championing her oppressed race. One day as I was sitting alone in the veranda, basking in the sun, and debating about whether I should rejoin Grant's army, I was surprised to see that this old creature hobbling toward me. After looking cautiously around to see that we were alone, she fumbled in the front of her dress and produced a small chemise leather bag which was hung round her neck by a white cord. Massa, she said, bending down and croaking the words into my ear, me die soon, me very old woman not stay long on Massa Murray's plantation. You may live a long time yet, Martha, I answered. You know I am a doctor. If you feel ill, let me know about it, and I will try to cure you. No wish to live, wish to die. I'm going to join the heavenly host. Here she relapsed into one of those half heathenous rhapsodies in which negroes indulge. But, Massa, me have one thing must leave behind me when I go. No able to take it with me across the Jordan. That one thing very precious more precious and more holy than all things else in the world. Me, a poor old black woman, have this because my people, very great people, suppose they was back in the old country. But you cannot understand the same as black folk could. My father gave it to me, and his father gave it to him. But now, who shall I give it to? Poor Martha have no child, no relation, nobody. All round I see black man, very bad man. Black woman, very stupid woman. Nobody worthy of the stone. And so I say, here is Massa Jeffson, who write books and fight for colored folk. He must be a good man, and he shall have it, though he is a white man, and never can know what it mean or where it came from. Here the old woman fumbled in the chemise leather bag and pulled out a flattish black stone with a hole through the middle of it. Here, take it, she said, pressing it into my hand. Take it. No harm never come from anything good. Keep it safe. Never lose it. And with a warming gesture, the old crone hobbled away in the same cautious way as she had come, looking from side to side to see if we had been observed. I was more amused than impressed by the old woman's earnestness, and was only prevented from laughing during her oration by the fear of hurting her feelings. When she was gone, I took a good look at the stone which she had given me. It was intensely black, of extreme hardness, and oval in shape, just such a flat stone as one would pick up on the seashore if one wished to throw a long way. It was about three inches long and an inch and a half broad at the middle, but rounded off at all extremities. The most curious part about it was several well-marked ridges which ran in semicircles over its surface and gave it exactly the appearance of a human ear. Altogether I was rather interested in my new possession and determined to submit it as a geological specimen to my friend Professor Schroeder of the New York Institute upon the earliest opportunity. In the meantime I thrust it into my pocket and rising from my chair I started off for a short stroll in the shrubbery, dismissing the incident from my mind. As my wound had nearly healed by this time, I took my leave of Mr. Murray shortly afterwards. The Union armies were everywhere victorious and converging on Richmond, so that my assistance seemed unnecessary, and I returned to Brooklyn. There I resumed my practice and married the second daughter of Josiah Vanberger, the well-known wood engraver. 
In the course of a few years it built up a good connection and acquired considerable reputation in the treatment of pulmonary complaints. I still kept the old black stone in my pocket, and frequently told the story of the dramatic way in which I had become possessed of it. I also kept my resolution of showing it to Professor Schroeder, who was much interested both by the anecdote and the specimen. He pronounced it to be a piece of meteoric stone, and drew my attention to the fact that it resembled to an ear was not accidental, but that it was most carefully worked into that shape. A dozen little anatomical points showed that the worker had been as accurate as he was skillful. I should not wonder, said the professor, if it were broken off from some larger statue, though how such hard material could be so perfectly worked is more than I can understand. If there is a statue to correspond, I should like to see it. So I thought at the time, but I have changed my opinion since. The next seven or eight years of my life were quiet and uneventful. Summer followed spring, and spring followed winter, without any variation in my duties. As the practice increased, I admitted J.S. Jackson as a partner, he to have one-fourth of the profits. The continued strain had told upon my constitution, however, and I became at last so unwell that my wife insisted upon my consulting Dr. Cavanaugh Smith, who was my colleague at the Samaritan Hospital. That gentleman examined me, and pronounced the apex of my left lung to be in a state of consolidation, recommending me at the same time to go through the course of medical treatment and to take a long sea voyage. My own disposition, which is naturally restless, predisposed me strongly in favor of the latter piece of advice, and the matter was clinched by my meeting young Russell, of the firm White, Russell, and White, who offered me a passage in one of his father's ships, the Mary Celeste, which was just starting from Boston. She's a snug little ship, he said, and Tibbs, the captain, is an excellent fellow. There is nothing like a sailing ship for an invalid. I was very much of the same opinion myself, so I closed with the offer on the spot. My original plan was that my wife should accompany me on my travels. She has always been a very poor sailor, however, and there were strong family reasons against her exposing herself to any risk at the time, so we determined that she should remain at home. I am not a religious or an effusive man, but oh, thank God for that. As to leaving my practice, I was easily reconciled to it, as Jackson, my partner, was a reliable and hard-working man. I arrived in Boston October 12, 1873, and proceeded immediately to the office of the firm in order to thank them for their courtesy. As I was sitting in the counting house, waiting until they should be at liberty to see me, the words of Mary Celeste suddenly attracted my attention. I looked round and saw a very tall, gaunt man who was leaning across the polished mahogany counter asking some questions of the clerk on the other side. His face was turned half towards me, and I could see that he had a strong dash of negro blood in him, being probably a quadroon or even nearer akin to the black. His curved aquiline nose and straight lank hair showed the white strain, but the dark, restless eyes, sensuous mouth, and gleaming teeth all told of his African origin. His complexion was of a sickly, unhealthy yellow, and as his face was deeply pitted with smallpox, the general impression was so unfavorable as to be almost revolting. When he spoke, however, it was in a soft, melodious tone and in well-chosen words, and he was evidently a man of some education. I wish to ask a few questions about the Mary Celeste, he repeated, leaning across to the clerk. She sails the day after tomorrow, does she not? Yes, sir, said the young clerk, awed into unusual politeness by the glimmer of a large diamond in the stranger's shirt front. Where is she bound for? Lisbon. How many of her crew? Seven, sir. Passengers? Yes, two. One of our young gentlemen and a doctor from New York. No gentleman from the South? asked the stranger eagerly. No, none, sir. Is there room for another passenger? Accommodation for three more, answered the clerk. I'll go, said the quadroon decisively. I'll go. I'll engage my passage at once. Put it down, will you? Mr. Septimus Goring of New Orleans. The clerk filled up a form and handed it over to the stranger, pointing to a blank space at the bottom. As Mr. Goring stooped over to sign it, I was horrified to observe that the fingers of his right hand had been lopped off, and that he was holding the pen between his thumb and the palm. I have seen thousands of slain in battle, and assisted at every conceivable surgical operation, but I cannot recall any sight which gave me such a thrill of disgust as that great brown sponge-like hand with a single member protruding from it. He used it skillfully enough, however, for dashing off his signature. He nodded to the clerk and strolled out of the office just as Mr. White sent out word that he was ready to receive me. I went down to the Mary Celeste that evening and looked over my berth, which was extremely comfortable considering the small size of the vessel. Mr. Goring, who I had seen that morning, was to have the one next to mine. Opposite was the captain's cabin and the small berth for Mr. John Harton, a gentleman who was going out in the interest of the firm. These little rooms were arranged on each side of the passage which led from the main deck to the saloon. The latter was a comfortable room, the paneling tastefully done in oak and mahogany, with a rich Brussels carpet and luxurious settees. I was very much pleased with the accommodation, and also with Tibbs the captain, a bluff, silly-like fellow, with a loud voice and hearty manner who welcomed me to the ship with effusion, and insisted upon our splitting a bottle of wine in his cabin. 
He told me that he intended to take his wife and the youngest child with him on the voyage, and that he hoped with good luck to make Lisbon in three weeks. We had a pleasant chat and parted the best of friends. He warning me to make the last of my preparations the next morning, as he intended to make a start by the midday tide, having now shipped all of his cargo. I went back to my hotel where I found a letter from my wife awaiting me, and after a refreshing night's sleep, returned to the boat in the morning. From this point I am able to quote from the journal which I kept in order to vary the monotony of the long sea voyage. If it is somewhat bald in places, I can at least rely upon its accuracy in details, as it was written conscientiously from day to day. October 16th. Cast off our warps at half-past two, and were towed out into the bay where the tug left us, and with all sail set, we bowled along at about nine knots an hour. I stood upon the poop watching the low land of America sinking gradually upon the horizon, until the evening haze hid it from my sight. A single red light, however, continued to blaze balefully behind us, throwing a long track like a trail of blood upon the water, and it is still visible as I write, though reduced to a mere speck. The captain is in bad humor, for two of his hands disappointed him at the last moment, and he was compelled to ship a couple of negroes who happened to be on the quay. The missing men were steady, reliable fellows who had been with him several voyages, and their non-appearance puzzled as well as irritated him. Where a crew of seven men have to work a fair-sized ship, the loss of two experienced seamen is a serious one. For though the negroes may take a spell at the wheel or swap the decks, they are of little or of no use in rough weather. Our cook is also a black man, and Mr. Septimus Goring has a little darky servant, so that we are rather a piebald community. The accountant, John Harton, promises to be an acquisition, for he is a cheery, amusing young fellow. Strange how little wealth has to do with happiness. He has all the world before him and is seeking his fortune in a far land, yet he is as transparently happy as a man can be. Goring is rich, if I'm not mistaken, and so am I. But I know that I have a lung, and Goring has some deeper trouble still, to judge by his features. How poorly do we both contrast with the careless, penniless clerk. October 17th. Mrs. Tibbs appeared upon the deck for the first time this morning, a cheerful, energetic woman with a dear little child just able to walk and prattle. Young Harton pounced on it at once, and carried it away to his cabin, where no doubt he will lay the seeds of future dyspepsia in the child's stomach. Thus medicine doth make cynics of us all. The weather is still all that could be desired, with the fine, fresh breeze from the west southwest. The vessel goes so steadily that you would hardly know that she was moving, were it not for the creaking of the cordage, and the bellying of the sails, and the long, white furrow in our wake. Walked the quarter-deck all morning with the captain, and I think the keen, fresh air has already done my breathing good, for the exercise did not fatigue me in any way. Tibbs is a remarkably intelligent man. We had an interesting argument about Maury's observations on ocean currents, which we terminated by going down to his cabin to consult the original work. There we found Goring, rather to the captain's surprise, and it is not usual for passengers to enter that sanctum unless specially invited. He apologized for his intrusion, however, pleading his ignorance of the usages of ship life and the good-natured sailor simply laughed at the incident, begging him to remain and favor us with his company. Goring pointed to the chronometers, the case in which he had opened, and remarked that he had been admiring them. He has evidently some practical knowledge of mathematical instruments, and he told us at a glance which was the most trustworthy of the three, and also named their price within a few dollars. He had a discussion with the captain, too, upon the variation of the compass, and when we came back to the ocean currents, he showed a thorough grasp of the subject, although he rather improves upon acquaintance, and is a man of decided culture and refinement. His voice harmonizes with his conversation, and both are the very antithesis of his face and figure. The noonday observation shows that we have run 220 miles. Toward evening, the breeze freshened up, and the first mate ordered the reefs to be taken in the top sails and top gallant sails in expectation of a windy night. I observe that the barometer has fallen to 29. I trust our voyage will not be a rough one, as I am a poor sailor, and my health will probably derive more harm than good from a stormy trip. Though I have the greatest confidence in the captain's seamanship, and in the soundness of the vessel. Played cribbage with Mrs. Tibbs after supper, and Harton gave us a couple of tunes in the violin. October 18th. The gloomy prognostications of the last night were not fulfilled, as the wind died away again, and we are lying now in a long, greasy swell, ruffled here and there by a fleeting cat's ball, which is insufficient to fill the sails. The air is colder than it was yesterday, and I have put on one of the thick woolen jerseys which my wife knitted for me. Harton came into my cabin in the morning, and we had a cigar together. He says he remembers having seen Goring in Cleveland, Ohio, in 69. He was, it appears, a mystery then, as now, wandering about without any visible employment, and extremely reticent of his own affairs. The man interests me as a psychological study. At breakfast this morning I suddenly had that vague feeling of uneasiness which comes upon some people when closely stared at. 
and looking quickly up i met his eyes bent upon me with an intensity which amounted to ferocity though their expression instantly softened as he made some conventional remark upon the weather curiously enough harton says that he has a very similar experience yesterday on deck i observe that goring frequently talks to the colored seamen as he strolls about a trait which i rather admire as it is common to find half-breeds ignore their dark strain and treat their black kinsfolk with greater intolerance than a white man would do his little page is devoted to him apparently which speaks well for his treatment of him altogether the man is a curious mixture of incongruous qualities unless i am deceived in him will give me food for observation during the voyage the captain is grumbling about his chronometers which do not register exactly the same time he says it is the first time they have ever disagreed we were unable to get a noonday observation on account of the haze by dead reckoning we have done about a hundred and seventy miles in twenty-four hours the dark seamen have proved as the skipper prophesied to be very inferior hands but as they could both manage to wheel well they are kept steering and so leave the more experienced men to work the ship these details are trivial enough but a small thing serves as food for gossip aboard ship the appearance of a whale in the evening caused quite a flutter among us from a sharp back and forked tail i should pronounce it to have been a rourke wall or finner as they are called by fishermen october nineteenth wind was cold and so i prudently remained in my cabin all day only creeping out for dinner lying in my bunk i can without moving reach my books pipes or anything else i may want which is one advantage of a small apartment my old wound began to ache a little today probably from the cold read montaigne's essays and nursed myself harton came in the afternoon with dotty the captain's child and the skipper himself followed so that i held quite a reception October 20th and 21st. Still cold with a continual drizzle of rain, and I have not been able to leave the cabin. The confinement makes me feel weak and depressed. Goring came in to see me, but his company did not tend to cheer me up as much, as he hardly uttered a word, but contented himself with staring at me in a peculiar and rather irritating manner. He then got up and stole out of the cabin without saying anything. I am beginning to suspect that the man is a lunatic. I think I mentioned that his cabin is next to mine. The two are simply divided by a thin wooden partition which is cracked in many places, some of the cracks being so large that I can hardly avoid, as I lie in my bunk, observing his motions in the adjoining room. Without any wish to play the spy, I see him continually stooping over what appears to be a chart and working with a pencil and compasses. I have remarked the interest he displays in matters connected with navigation, but I am surprised that he should take the trouble to work out the course of the ship. However, it is a harmless amusement enough, and no doubt he verifies his results by those of the captain. I wish the man did not run in my thoughts so much. I had a nightmare on the night of the 20th in which I thought my bunk was a coffin, and I laid out in it, and that Goring was endeavoring to nail up the lid, which I was frantically pushing away. Even when I woke up, I could hardly persuade myself that I was not in a coffin. As a medical man, I know that a nightmare is simply a vascular derangement of the cerebral hemispheres, and yet in my weak state, I cannot shake off the morbid impression which it produces. October 22nd. A fine day, with hardly a cloud in the sky and a fresh breeze from the southwest, which wafts us gaily on our way. There has evidently been some heavy weather near us, and there is a tremendous swell on, and the ship lurches until the end of the foreyard nearly touches the water. Had a refreshing walk upon the quarter-deck, though I have hardly found my sea-legs yet. Several small birds, chaffinches, I think, perched in the rigging. 4.40 p.m. While I was on deck this morning I heard a sudden explosion from the direction of my cabin, and hurrying down, found that I had very nearly met with a serious accident. Goring was cleaning a revolver, it seemed, in his cabin, when one of the barrels which he thought was unloaded went off. The ball passed through the side partition and embedded itself in the bulwarks in the exact place where my head usually rests. I have been under fire too often to magnify trifles, but there is no doubt that if I had been in the bunk, it must have killed me. Goring, poor fellow, did not know that I had gone on deck that day, and must therefore have felt terribly frightened. I never saw such emotion in a man's face as when, on rushing out of his cabin with a smoking pistol in his hand, he met me face to face as I came down from the deck. Of course, he was profuse in his apologies, though I simply laughed at the incident. 11 p.m. A misfortune has occurred so unexpected and so horrible that my little escape of the morning dwindles into insignificance. Mrs. Tibbs and her child have disappeared, utterly and entirely disappeared. I can hardly compose myself to write the sad details. About half-past eight, Tibbs rushed into my cabin with a very white face and asked me if I had seen his wife. I answered that I had not. He then ran wildly into the saloon and began groping about for any trace of her, while I followed him, endeavoring vainly to persuade him that his fears were ridiculous. We hunted over the ship for an hour and a half, without coming on any sign of the missing woman or child. Poor Tibbs lost his voice completely from calling her name. Even the sailors, who are generally stolid enough, 
were deeply affected by the sight of him as he roamed bareheadedly and disheveled about the deck searching with feverish anxiety the most impossible places and returning to them again and again with piteous pertinacity the last time she was seen was about seven o'clock when she took dotty onto the poop to give him a breath of fresh air before putting him to bed there was no one there at the time except a black seaman at the wheel who denies having seen her at all the whole affair is wrapped in mystery my own theory is that while mrs tibbs was holding the child and standing near the bulwarks it gave a spring and fell overboard and that in her convulsive attempt to catch or save him she followed it i cannot account for the double disappearance in any other way it is quite feasible that such a tragedy should be enacted without the knowledge of the man at the wheel since it was dark at the time and the peaked skylights of the saloon screened the greater part of the quarter-deck whatever the truth may be it is a terrible catastrophe and has cast the darkest gloom upon our voyage the mate has put the ship about but of course there is not the slightest hope of picking them up the captain is lying in a state of stupor in his cabin i gave him a powerful dose of opium and his coffee and for a few hours at least his anguish may be deadened october twenty third woke with a vague feeling of heaviness and misfortune but it was not until a few moments reflection that i was able to recall our loss of the night before when i came on deck i saw the poor skipper standing gazing back at the waste of waters behind us which contained everything dear to him upon earth I attempted to speak to him, but he turned brusquely away and began pacing the deck with his head sunk upon his breast. Even now, when the truth is so clear, he cannot pass a boat or an unbent sail without peering under it. He looks ten years older than he did yesterday morning. Harton is terribly cut up, for he was fond of little Dotty, and Goring seems sorry too. At least he has shut himself up in his cabin all day. When I got a casual glance at him, his head was resting on his two hands, as if in a melancholy reverie. I fear we are about as dismal a crew as ever sailed. How shocked my wife will be to hear of our disaster. The swell has gone down now, and we are doing about eight knots with all sail set and a nice little breeze. Hyson is practically in command of the ship, as Tibbs, though he does his best to bear up and keep a brave front, is incapable of applying himself to serious work. October 24th. Is the ship accursed? Was there ever a voyage which began so fairly and which changed so disastrously? Tibbs shot himself through the head during the night. I was awakened about three o'clock in the morning by an explosion, and they immediately sprang out of bed and rushed into the cabin's cabin to find out the cause, though with a terrible presentiment in my heart. Quickly as I went, Goring went more quickly still, for he was already in the cabin, stooping over the dead body of the captain. It was a hideous sight, for the whole front of his face was blown in, and the little room was swimming in blood. The pistol was lying beside him on the floor, just as it had dropped from his hand. He had evidently put it to his mouth before pulling the trigger. Gorgon and I picked him reverently up and laid him on the bed. The crew had all clustered into his cabin, and the six white men were deeply grieved, for they were old hands who had sailed with him many years. There were dark looks and murmurs among them, too, and one of them openly declared that the ship was haunted. Harton helped to lay the poor skipper out, and we did him up in the canvas between us. At twelve o'clock the foreyard was hauled aback, and we committed his body to the deep. Goring reading the Church of England burial services. The breeze had freshened up, and we have done ten knots all day, and sometimes twelve. The sooner we reach Lisbon and get away from this accursed ship, the better pleased shall I be. I feel as though we were in a floating coffin. Little wonder that the poor sailors are superstitious when I, an educated man, felt it so strongly. October 25th. Made a good run all day. Feel listless and depressed. October 26th. Goring, Harton, and I had a chat together on deck in the morning. Harton tried to draw going out as to his profession and its object in going to Europe, but the quadroon parried all his questions and gave us no information. Indeed, he seemed to be slightly offended by Harton's pertinacity and went down into his cabin. I wonder why we should both take such an interest in this man. I suppose it is his striking appearance coupled with his apparent wealth which piques our curiosity. Harton has a theory that he is really a detective, that he is after some criminal who has got away to Portugal, and that he chooses this particular way of traveling that he may arrive unnoticed and pounce upon his quarry unawares. I think the superstition is rather a far-fetched one, but Harton bases it upon a book which Goring left on deck, and which he picked up and glanced over. It was sort of a scrapbook, it seemed, and contained a large number of newspaper cuttings. All these cuttings related to murders which had been committed at various times in the States during the last twenty years or so. The curious thing which Harton observed about them, however, was that there were invariably murders the authors of which had never been brought to justice. They varied in every detail, he says, as to the manner of execution and the social status of the victim but they uniformly wound up with the same formula that the murderer was still at large, though, of course, the police had every reason to expect his speedy capture. Certainly the incident seems to support Harton's theory, 
though it may be a mere whim of Goring's, or, as I suggested to Harton, he may be collecting materials for a book which I'll advise to Quincy. In any case, it is no business of ours. October 27th, 28th. Wind still fair, and we are making good progress. Strange how easily a human unit may drop out of its place and be forgotten. Tibbs is hardly ever mentioned now. Hyson has taken possession of his cabin, and all goes on as before. Were it not for Mrs. Tibbs' sewing machine upon the side table, we might forget that the unfortunate family ever existed. Another accident occurred on board today, though fortunately not a very serious one. One of our white hands had gone down the afterhold to fetch up a spare coil of rope, when one of the hatches he had removed came crashing down on top of him. He saved his life by springing out of the way, but one of his feet was terribly crushed, and he will be of little use for the remainder of the voyage. He attributes the accident to the carelessness of his negro companion, who had helped him to shift the hatches. The latter, however, puts it down to the roll of the ship. Whatever be the cause, it reduces our short-handed crew still further. This run of ill luck seems to be depressing heart, for he has lost his usual good spirits and joviality. Goring is the only one who preserves his cheerfulness. I see him still working at his chart in his own cabin. His nautical knowledge would be useful should anything happen to Heisen, which, God forbid. October 29th, 30th. Still bowling along with a fresh breeze. All quiet and nothing of note to chronicle. October 31st. My weak lungs, combined with the exciting episodes of the voyage, have shaken my nervous system so much that the most trivial incident affects me. I can hardly believe I'm the same man who tied the external iliac artery, an operation requiring the nicest precision under a heavy rifle fire at Antietam. I am as nervous as a child. I was lying half-dozing last night about four bells in the middle watch, trying in vain to drop into a refreshing sleep. There was no light inside my cabin, but a single ray of moonlight streamed in through the porthole, throwing a silvery flickering circle upon the door. As I lay, I kept my drowsy eyes upon this circle, and was conscious that it was gradually becoming less well-defined as my senses left me, when I was suddenly recalled to full wakefulness by the appearance of a small, dark object in the very center of the luminous disk. I lay quietly and breathlessly watching it. Gradually it grew larger and plainer, and then I perceived that it was a human hand which had been cautiously inserted through the chink in the half-closed door, a hand which, as I observed with a thrill of horror, was not provided with fingers. The door swung cautiously backward, and Goring's head followed his hand. It appeared in the center of the moonlight, and was framed as if it were a ghastly, uncertain halo, against which his features showed out plainly. It seemed to me that I have never seen such an utterly fiendish and merciless expression on a human face. His eyes were dilated and glaring, his lips drawn back as to show his white fangs, and his straight black hair appeared to bristle over his low forehead like the hood of a cobra. The sudden and nauseous apparition had such an effect upon me that I sprang up in bed trembling in every limb, and held out my hand toward my revolver. I was hardly ashamed of my hastiness when he explained the object of his intrusion, as he immediately did in the most courteous language. He had been suffering from toothache, poor fellow, and had come in to beg some laudanum, knowing that I possessed a medicine chest. As to a sinister expression, he is never a beauty, and what with my state of nervous tension and the effect of the shifting moonlight, it was easy to conjure up something horrible. I gave him twenty drops, and he went off again with many expressions of gratitude. I can hardly say how much this trivial incident affected me. I felt unstrung all day. A week's record of our voyage is here omitted, as nothing eventful occurred during the time, and my log consists merely of a few pages of unimportant gossip. November 7th. Harton and I sat on the poop all the morning, for the weather is becoming very warm, and we come into the southern latitudes. We reckon that we have done two-thirds of our voyage. How glad we shall be to see the green banks of the Tagus, and leave this unlucky ship forever. I was endeavoring to amuse Harton today, and to while away the time by telling him some of the experiences of my past life. Among others, I related to him how I came into possession of my black stone, and as a finale, I rummaged into the side pocket of my old shooting coat and produced the identical object in question. He and I were bending over it together, I pointing out to him the curious ridges upon its surface, when we were conscious of a shadow falling between us and the sun, and looking round saw Goring standing behind us, glaring over our shoulders at the stone. For some reason or other, he appeared to be powerfully excited, though he was evidently trying to control himself and to conceal his emotion. He pointed once or twice at my relic with his stubby thumb before he could recover himself sufficiently to ask what it was and how I obtained it, a question put in such a brusque manner that I should have been offended had I not known the man to be an eccentric. I told him the story very much as I had told it to Harton. He listened with the deepest interest and then asked me if I had any idea what the stone was. I said I had not, beyond that it was meteoric. He asked me if I ever tried its effects upon a negro. I said I had not. Come, said he, we'll see what our black friend at the wheel thinks of it. 
He took the stone in his hand and went across to the sailor, and the two examined it carefully. I could see the man gesticulating and nodding his head excitedly as if making some assertion, while his face betrayed the utmost astonishment, mixed, I think, with some reverence. Goring came across the deck to us presently, still holding the stone in his hand. He says it is a worthless, useless thing, he said, and fit only to be chucked overboard, with which he raised his hand and would have most certainly made an end of my route had the black sailor behind him not rushed forward and seized him by the wrist. Finding himself secured, Goring dropped the stone and turned away with a very bad grace to avoid my angry remonstrations at his breach of faith. The black picked up the stone and handed it to me with a low bow and every sign of profound respect. The whole affair is inexplicable. I am rapidly coming to the conclusion that Goring is a maniac or something very near one. When I compare the effect produced by the stone upon the sailor, however, with the respect shown to Martha on the plantation, and the surprise of Goring on his first production, I cannot but come to the conclusion that I have really got hold of some powerful talisman which appeals to the whole dark race. I must not trust it in Goring's hands again. November 8th, 9th What splendid weather we are having! Beyond one little blow, we have had nothing but fresh breezes the whole voyage. These two days we have made better runs than any hitherto. It is a pretty thing to watch the spray fly up from our prow as it cuts through the waves. The sun shines through it and breaks it up a number of miniature rainbows. Sun dogs, the sailors call them. I stood on the forecastle head for several hours today, watching the effect, and surrounded by a halo of prismatic colors. The steersmen had evidently told the other blacks about my wonderful stone, for I am treated by them with all the greatest respect. Talking about optical phenomenon, we had a curious one yesterday evening which was pointed out to me by Heisen. This was the appearance of a triangular, well-defined object high up in the heavens to the north of us. He explained that it was exactly like the peak of Tenerife, as seen from a great distance. The peak was, however, at that moment at least five hundred miles to the south. It may have been a cloud, or it may be one of those strange reflections of which one reads. The weather is very warm. The mate says that he had never knew it so warm at these latitudes. Play chess with Hartman in the evening. November 10th. It is getting warmer and warmer. Some land birds came and perched in the rigging today, but we are still a considerable way from our destination. The heat is so great that we are too lazy to do anything but lounge about decks and smoke. Goring came over to me today and asked me some more questions about my stone, but I answered him rather shortly, for I have not quite forgiven him yet for the cool way in which he attempted to deprive me of it. November 11th and 12th. Still making good progress. I had no idea Portugal was ever as hot as this, but no doubt it is cooler on land. Heisen himself seemed surprised at it, and so do the men. November 13th. A most extraordinary event has happened, so extraordinary as to be almost inexplicable. Either Heisen has blundered wonderfully, or some magnetic influence has disturbed our instruments. Just about daybreak, the watch in the forecastle head shouted out that he heard the sound of surf ahead, and Heisen thought that he saw the loom of land. The ship was put about, and though no lights were seen, none of us doubted that we had struck the Portuguese coast a little sooner than we had expected. What was our surprise to see the scene that was revealed to us at the break of day? As far as we could look on either side was one long line of surf, great green billows rolling in and breaking into a cloud of foam. But behind the surf, what was there? Not the green banks nor the high cliffs of the shores of Portugal, but a great sandy waste which stretched away and away until it blended with the skyline. To right and left, look where you would, there was nothing but yellow sand heaped in some places into fantastic mounds. Some of them, several hundred feet high, while in other parts were long stretches as level, apparently, as a billiard board. Harton and I, who had come on deck together, looked at each other in astonishment, and Harton burst out laughing. Heisen is exceedingly mortified at the occurrence, and protests that the instruments have been tampered with. There is no doubt that this is the mainland of Africa, and that it was really the peak of Tenerife, which we saw some days ago upon the northern horizon. At the time when we saw the land birds, we must have been passing some of the Canary Islands. If we continued on the same course, we are now to the north of Cape Blanco, near the unexplored country, which skirts the Great Sahara. All we could do is to rectify our instruments as far as possible and start afresh for our destination. 8.30 p.m. Have been lying in a calm all day. The coast is now about a mile and a half from us. Heisen has examined the instruments but cannot find any reason for their extraordinary deviation. This is the end of my private journal, and I must make the remainder of my statement from memory. There is little chance of my being mistaken about facts which have seared themselves into my recollection. That very night the storm which had been brewing so long burst over us, and I came to learn whether all those little incidents were tending which I had recorded so aimlessly. Blind fool that I was not to have seen it sooner, I shall tell what occurred as precisely as I can. I got into my cabin about half-past eleven, and was preparing to go to bed, when a tap came at my door. 
On opening it, I saw Goring's little black page, who told me that his master would like to have a word with me on deck. I was rather surprised that he should want me at such a late hour, but I went up without hesitation. I had hardly put my foot on the quarter deck before I was seized from behind, dragged down upon my back, and a handkerchief slipped round my mouth. I struggled as hard as I could, but a coil of rope was rapidly and firmly wound around me, and I found myself lashed to the davit of one of the boats, utterly powerless to do or say anything, while the point of a knife pressed to my throat warned me to cease my struggles. The night was so dark that I had been unable hitherto to recognize my assailants, but as my eyes became accustomed to the gloom and the moon broke out through the clouds that obscured it, I made out that I was surrounded by the two negro sailors, the black cook, and my fellow passenger, Goring. Another man was crouching on the deck at my feet, but he was in the shadow, and I could not recognize him. All this occurred so rapidly that a minute could hardly have elapsed from the time I mounted the companion until I found myself gagged and powerless. It was so sudden that I could scarce bring myself to realize it, or to comprehend what it all meant. I heard the gang round me speaking in short, fierce whispers to each other, and some instinct told me that my life was the question at issue. Goring spoke authoritatively and angrily, the others doggedly and altogether as if disputing his commands. Then they moved away in a body to the opposite side of the deck, where I could still hear them whispering, though they were concealed from my view by the saloon skylights. All this time the voices on the watch of the deck chatting and laughing at the other end of the ship were distinctly audible, and I could see them gathered in a group, little dreaming of the dark doings which were going on within thirty yards of them. Oh, that I could have given them one word of warning, even though I had lost my life in doing it, but it was impossible. The moon was shining fitfully through the scattered clouds, and I could see the silvery gleam of the surge, and beyond it the vast weird desert with its fantastic sand hills. Glancing down, I saw that the man who had been crouching on the deck was still lying there, and as I gazed at him, a flickering ray of moonlight fell full upon his upturned face. Great heaven! Even now, when more than twelve years have elapsed, my hand trembles as I write this. In spite of distorted features and projecting eyes, I recognized the face of Harton the cheery young clerk who had been my companion during the voyage. It needed no medical eye to see that he was quite dead, while the twisted handkerchief round the neck and the gag in his mouth showed the silent way in which the hellhounds had done their work. The clue which explained every event of our voyage came upon me with a flash of light as I gazed upon poor Harton's corpse. Much was dark and unexplained, but I felt a great dim perception of the truth. I heard the striking of a match at the other side of the skylights, and then I saw the tall, gaunt figure of Goring standing up in the bulwarks and holding in his hands what appeared to be a dark lantern. He lowered this for a moment over the side of the ship, and to my inexpressible astonishment I saw it answered instantaneously by a flash among the sand hills on shore, which came and went so rapidly that unless I had been following the direction of Goring's gaze, I should never have detected it. Again he lowered the lantern, and again it was answered from the shore. He then stepped down from the bulwarks, and in doing so slipped, making such a noise that for a moment my heart bounded with the thought that the attention of the watch would be directed to his proceedings. It was a vain hope. The night was calm and the ship motionless, and so that no idea of duty kept them vigilant. Hyson, who after the death of Tibbs was in command on both watches, had gone below to snatch a few hours' sleep, and the boatswain, who was left in charge, was standing with the other two men at the foot of the foremast. Powerless, speechless, with the cords cutting to my flesh, and the murdered man at my feet, I awaited the next act in the tragedy. The four ruffians were standing up now at the other side of the deck. The cook was armed with some sort of cleaver. The others had knives, and Goring had a revolver. They were all leaning against the rail and looking out over the waters as if watching for something. I saw one of them grasp another's arms and point as if at some object, and following the direction I made out the loom of a large moving mass making toward the ship. As it emerged from the gloom I saw that it was a great canoe crammed with men, and propelled by at least a score of paddlers. As it shot under our stern, the watch caught sight of it also, and raising a cry, hurried aft. They were too late, however, and a swarm of gigantic negroes clambered over the quarter, and led by Goring, swept down the deck in an irresistible torrent. All opposition was overpowered in a moment. The unarmed watch were knocked over and bound, and the sleepers dragged out of their bunks and secured in the same manner. Heisen made an attempt to defend the narrow passage leading to his cabin, and I heard a scuffle, and his voice shouted for assistance. There was none to assist, however, and he was brought onto the poop with the blood streaming from a deep cut in his forehead. He was gagged like the others, and a council was held upon our fate by the negroes. I saw our black seaman pointing towards me and making some statement, which was received with murmurs of astonishment and incredulity by the savages. One of them then came over to me, and plunging his hand in my pocket, took out my black stone and held it up. He then handed it to a man who appeared to be a chief, who examined it as minutely as the light would permit and muttering a few words, passed it to the warrior beside him, who also scrutinized it, and passed it on until it had gone from hand to hand around the whole circle. 
The chief had said a few words to Goring in the native tongue, on which the quadroon addressed me in English. At this moment I seemed to see the scene. The tall mast of the ship with the moonlight streaming down, silvering the yards, and bringing the network of cordage into hard relief. The group of dusky warriors leaning on their spears, the dead man at my feet, the line of white-faced prisoners, and in front of me the loathsome half-breed, looking in his white linen and elegant clothes a strange contrast to his associates. "'You will bear me witness,' he said in his softest accents, "'that I am no party to sparing your life. If it rests with me, you would die as these other men are about to. I have no personal grudge against either you or them, but I have devoted my life to the destruction of the white race, and you are the first that has ever been in my power and has escaped me. You may thank that stone of yours for your life. These poor fellows reverence it, and indeed if it really be what they think it is, they have cause. Should it prove that when we get ashore that they are mistaken, and that its shape and material is a mere chance, nothing can save your life. In the meantime, we wish to treat you well, so if there are any of your possessions which you would like to take with you, you are at liberty to get them. As he finished, he gave a sign, and a couple of the negroes unbound me, though without removing the gag. I was led down into the cabin where I put a few valuables into my pockets, together with a pocket compass and my journal of the voyage. Then they pushed me over the side into a small canoe, which was lying beside the large one, and my guards followed me, and shoving off, began paddling for the shore. We got about a hundred yards or so from the ship when our steersman held up his hand, and the paddlers paused for a moment and listened. Then on the silence of the night I heard a sort of dull, moaning sound, followed by a succession of splashes in the water. That is all I know of the fate of my poor shipmates. Almost immediately afterwards the large canoe followed us, and the deserted ship was left drifting about, a dreary, specter-like hulk. Nothing was taken from her by the savages. The whole fiendish transaction was carried through as decorously and temperately as though it were a religious rite. The first gray of daylight was visible in the east, and we passed through the surge and reached the shore. Leaving a half-dozen men with the canoes, the rest of the negroes set off through the sand hills, leading me with them, but treating me very gently and respectfully. It was difficult walking, as we sank over our ankles in the loose, shifting sand at every step, and I was nearly dead beat by the time we reached the native village, or town rather for it was a place of considerable dimensions. The houses were conical structures, not unlike beehives, and were made of compressed seaweed cemented over a rude form of mortar, there being neither stick nor stone upon the coast, nor anywhere within many hundreds of miles. As we entered the town, an enormous crowd of both sexes came swarming out to meet us, beating tom-toms and howling and screaming. On seeing me, they redoubled their yells and assumed a threatening attitude, which was instantly quelled by a few words shouted by my escort. A buzz of wonder succeeded the war cries and yells of the moment before, and the whole dense mass proceeded down the broad central street of the town, having my escort and myself in the center. My statement hitherto may seem so strange as to excite doubt in the minds of those who do not know me, but it was the fact which I am now about to relate which caused my own brother-in-law to insult me by disbelief. I can but relate to the occurrence in the simplest words, and trust to chance and time to prove their truth. In the center of this main street there was a large building, formed in the same primitive way as the others but towering high above them. A stockade of beautifully polished ebony rails was planted all around it. The framework of the door was formed by two magnificent elephant's tusks sunk in the ground on each side and meeting at the top, and the aperture was closed by a screen of native cloth richly embroidered with gold. We made our way to this imposing-looking structure, but on reaching the opening in the stockade, the multitude stopped and squatted down upon their hams, while I was led through into the enclosure by a few of the chiefs and the elders of the tribe, Goring accompanying us, and in fact, directing the proceedings. On reaching the screen which closed the temple, for such it evidently was, my hat and my shoes were removed, and I was then led in, a venerable old negro leading the way, carrying in his hand my stone, which had been taken from my pocket. The building was only lit up by a few long slits in the roof, through which the tropical sun poured, throwing broad golden bars upon the clay floor, alternating with intervals of darkness. The interior was even larger than one would have imagined from the outside appearance. The walls were hung with native mats, shells, and other ornaments, but the remainder of the great space was quite empty, with the exception of a single object in the center. This was the figure of a colossal negro, which I at first thought to be some real king or high priest of titanic size, but as I approached it I saw by the way in which the light was reflected from it that it was a statue admirably cut in jet black stone. I was led up to this idol for such a scene to be, and looking at it closer I saw that though it was perfect in every respect, one of its ears had been broken short off. The gray-haired negro who held my relic mounted upon a small stool, and stretching up his arm, fitted Martha's black stone onto the jagged surface of the side of the statue's head. There could be no doubt that the one had been broken off from the other. The parts dovetailed together so accurately that when the old man removed his hand, the ear stuck in its place for a few seconds before dropping into his open palm. 
The group round me prostrated themselves upon the ground at the sight with a cry of reverence, while the crowd outside, to whom the result was communicated, set up a wild whooping and cheering. In a moment I found myself converted from a prisoner into a demigod. I was escorted back through the town in triumph, the people pressing forward to touch my clothing and to gather up the dust upon which my foot had trod. One of the largest huts was put at my disposal, and a banquet of every native delicacy was served me. I still felt, however, that I was not a free man, as several spearmen were placed on guard at the entrance of my hut. All day my mind was occupied with plans of escape, but none seemed in any way feasible. On the one side was the great arid desert stretching away to Timbuktu. On the other was a sea untraversed by vessels. The more I pondered over the problem, the more hopeless did it seem. I little dreamed how near I was to its solution. Night had fallen, and the clamor of the negroes had died gradually away. I was stretched on the couch of skins which had been provided for me, and was still meditating over my future, when Goring walked stealthily into my hut. My first idea was that he had come to complete his murderous holocaust by making away with me, the last survivor, and I sprung up upon my feet, determined to defend myself to the last. He smiled when he saw the action, and motioned me down again while he seated himself upon the other end of the couch. "'What do you think of me?' was the astonishing question with which he commenced our conversation. "'Think of you!' I almost yelled. "'I think you're the vilest, most unnatural renegade that ever polluted the earth. If we were away with these black devils of yours, I would strangle you with my hands.' "'Don't speak so loud,' he said, without the slightest appearance of irritation. "'I don't want our chat to be cut short. So you would strangle me, would you?' he went on, with an amused smile. I suppose I am returning good for evil, for I have come to help you escape. You? I gasped incredulously. Yes, I, he continued. Oh, there's no credit to me in this matter. I am quite consistent. There is no reason why I should not be perfectly candid with you. I wish to be king over these fellows. Not a very high ambition, certainly, but you know what Caesar said about being first in a village in Gaul. Well, this unlucky stone of yours has not only saved your life, but has turned all their heads, so that they think you are coming down from heaven and my influence will be gone until you are out of the way. That is why I am going to help you escape, since I cannot kill you. This in the most natural and dulcet voice, as if the desire to do so were a matter of course. You would give the world to ask a few questions, he went on after a pause, but you are too proud to do it. Never mind, I'll tell you one or two things, because I want your fellow white men to know them when you go back, if you are lucky enough to get back. About that cursed stone of yours, for instance. Those negroes, or at least so the legend goes, were Mohammedans originally. When Mohammed himself was still alive, there was a schism among his followers, and the smaller party moved away from Arabia and eventually crossed Africa. They took away with them in their exile the valuable relic of their old faith in the shape of a large piece of the black stone of Mecca. The stone was a meteoric one, as you may have heard, and in its fall upon the earth it broke into two pieces. One of these pieces is still in Mecca. The larger piece was carried away to Barbary, where a skillful worker modeled it into the fashion which you saw today. These men are the descendants of the original seceders from Mohammed, and they have brought their relics safely through all their wanderings until they settled in this strange place, where the desert protects them from their enemies. And the ear? I asked almost involuntarily. Oh, that was the same story over again. Some of the tribe wandered away to the south a few hundred years ago, and one of them, wishing to have good luck for the enterprise, got into the temple at night and carried off one of the ears. There had been a tradition among the Negroes ever since that the ear would come back some day. The fellow who carried it was caught by some slavery, no doubt, and that was how he got it to America, and so into your hands, and you have had the honor of fulfilling the prophecy. He paused for a few minutes, resting his head upon his hands, waiting apparently for me to speak. When he looked up again, the whole expression of his face had changed. His features were firm and set, and he changed the air of half levity with which he had spoken before for one of sternness and almost ferocity. I wish you to carry a message back, he said, to the white race, the great dominating race whom I hate and defy. Tell them I have battened on their blood for twenty years, that I have slain them until even I became tired of what had once been a joy, and I did this unnoticed and unsuspected in the face of every precaution which their civilization could suggest. There is no satisfaction in revenge when your enemy does not know who has struck him. I am not sorry, therefore, to have you as a messenger. There is no need why I should tell you how this great hate become born in me. See this? And he held up his mutilated hand. This was done by a white man's knife. My father was white. My mother was a slave. When he died, she was sold again, and I, a child then, saw her lashed to death to break her of some of the little airs and graces which her late master had encouraged in her. My young wife, too. Oh, my young wife. A shudder ran through his whole frame. No matter. I swore my oath and I kept it. From Maine to Florida, from Boston to San Francisco, you could track my steps by sudden deaths which baffled the police. I warred against the whole white race, 
as they for centuries had warred against the black one. At last, as I tell you, I sickened of blood. Still, the sight of a white face was abhorrent to me, and I determined to find some bold free black people and to throw in my lot with them, to cultivate their latent powers and to form a nucleus for a great, colored nation. This idea possessed me, and I traveled over the world for two years seeking for what I desired. At last, I was almost despaired of finding it. There was no hope of regeneration in the slave-dealing Soudanese, the debased Fantee, or the Americanized Negroes of Liberia. I was returning from my quest when chance brought me in contact with this magnificent tribe of dwellers in the desert, and I threw in my lot with them. Before doing so, however, my old instinct of revenge prompted me to make one last visit to the United States, and I returned from it in the Mary Celeste. As to the voyage itself, your intelligence will have told you by this time that, thanks to my manipulations, both compasses and chronometers were entirely untrustworthy. I alone worked out the course with correct instruments of my own, while the steering was done with my black friends under my guidance. I pushed Tibbs' wife overboard. What? You look surprised and shrink away. Surely you had guessed that by the time. I would have shot you that day through the partition, but unfortunately you were not there. I tried again afterwards, but you were awake. I shot Tibbs. I think the idea of suicide was carried out rather neatly. Of course, when once we got on the coast, the rest was simple. I had bargained that all on board should die, but that stone of yours upset my plans. I also bargained that there should be no plunder. No one can say we are pirates. We have acted from principle and not from any sordid motive. I listened in amazement to the summary of his crimes which this strange man had gave me, all in the quietest and most composed of voices, as though detailing incidents of everyday occurrence. I still seemed to see him sitting like a hideous nightmare at the end of my couch, with a single rude lamp flickering over his cadaverous features. And now, he continued, there is no difficulty about your escape. These stupid adopted children of mine will say that you have gone back to heaven from whence you came. The wind blows off the land. I have a boat all ready for you, well stored with provisions and water. I am anxious to be rid of you, so you may rely that nothing is neglected. Rise up and follow me. I did what he commanded, and he led me through the door of the hut. The guards had either been withdrawn, or Gordon had arranged matters with them. We passed unchallenged through the town and across the sandy plain. Once more I heard the roar of the sea and saw the long white line of the surge. Two figures were standing upon the shore arranging the gear of the small boat. They were the two sailors who had been with us on the voyage. See him safely through the surf, said Goring. The two men sprang in and pushed off, pulling me in after them. With mainsail and jib, we ran out from the land and passed safely over the bar. Then my two companions, without a word of farewell, sprang overboard, and I saw their heads like black dots on the white foam as they made their way back to the shore, while I scudded away into the blackness of the night. Looking back, I caught my last glimpse of Goring. He was standing upon the summit of a sand hill and the rising moon behind him threw his gaunt, angular figure into hard relief. He was waving his arms frantically to and fro. It may have been to encourage me on my way, but the gesture seemed to me at the time to be a threatening one. I have often thought that it was more likely that his old savage instinct had returned when he realized that I was out of his power. Be that as it may, it was the last thing I ever saw or shall ever see of Septimus Goring. There is no need for me to dwell upon my solitary voyage. I steered as well as I could from the Canaries, but I was picked up upon the fifth day by the British and African Steam Navigation Company's boat, Monrovia. Let me take this opportunity of tendering my sincerest thanks to Captain Stornoway and his officers for the great kindness which they showed me from that time till they landed me in Liverpool, where I was able to take one of the Guyon boats to New York. From the day on which I found myself once more in the bosom of my family, I have said little of what I have undergone. The subject is still an intensely painful one to me, and the little which I have dropped has been discredited. I now put the facts before the public as they occurred, careless how far they may be believed, and simply writing them down because my lung is growing weaker, and I feel the responsibility of holding my peace longer. I make no vague statement. Turn to your map of Africa. There above Cape Blanco, where the land trends towards north and south from the westernmost point of the continent, there it is that Septimus Goring still reigns over his dark subjects, unless retribution has overtaken him, and there, where the long green ridges run swiftly in to roar and hiss upon the hot yellow sand. It is there their heart and lies with Hyson and the other poor fellows who were done to death in the Mary Celeste. 